Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the only essential Mission Impossible podcast. Who told us that recently, Charles? Did someone say we were essential? Yeah. I feel like you're ready to talk shit to all the other podcasts out there. I am. I'm fighting. There's room for more Mission Impossible fans in the world. That's true. I just don't want anybody encroaching on our territory. But we've got a pretty good base going, base level going. So I'm not I'm not too threatened, you know, but yeah, right. I just got to make it clear. Uh, I feel like the way that you're acting means that you are kind of threatened. No, I'm just, you know, I'm defending my turf is what I'm doing. <laughs> so got that going on. Um, today we are talking. This is the first part of our Dan Mandel interview, right? Yes, it is. So we've been sitting on this bad boy for months and months. Dan Mandel is uh, obviously one of the most exciting cinematographers working today. He has done uh, JJ's 2009 Star Trek. He worked with Tony Scott. And he, of course, shot Mission Impossible 3. So this was a big thrill. Oh, yeah. I mean, he talks about so much awesome stuff. But it's really cool to hear him this week talk about Tony Scott. He's got some great stories about about Tony Scott that I was it was really cool to hear. Yeah, and he's very funny. We were talking to him from Hawaii, so we had to figure out those time zones, which was which was a challenge. And uh, yeah, I loved talking to him. I thought he was uh, really interesting and thoughtful and funny. And I can't wait for people to finally hear this. Yeah, we talked to him a while ago now, but uh, very excited to share this with the world. Uh, we got any we got any stuff to go through here, Charles? Well, there was just a, a few days ago from uh, our, our, you know when we we're recording this. Uh, Christopher McQuarrie and Tom Cruise went to the movie theaters to see Tenet in IMAX in London. Yeah. We haven't really gotten quite all the details, but I saw someone say something about like Tom Cruise renting out the theater for the cast and crew of MI7. Uh, I don't know if that's true because there was a little Indian kid that was in the theater with him that took a picture with him afterwards, unless that oh, yeah. person is part of the cast or crew. But could uh, be, could, it could, be uh, the, could be the son of someone in the crew. It's true. It's true. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a that was really funny. And it, it was like instantly memed all over the place, which was which was great. Well, and the thing for us that was so important is, uh, you know, this confirmed for MI7, a short haircut. Oh, oh, wait. We, 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 I mean, we could do a whole Patreon episode about this hair, but <laughs> his hair looked great. It did. It, it looks almost like a throwback all the way back to, to Mission Impossible 1. Almost. It is. It's sort of more, it's more vertical. This might just yeah. be, you know, the ne- necessities of the mask, but no bangs, just straight up. Got a little salt and pepper in there too, which we, we love. Yes, love. It felt like almost like a cross between, you know, his hair from 3 and his hair from 1, you know? Just yeah. Like, oh, we just yeah. love it, love it. Oh my god, this hairstyle. It's too much. It sent us over the edge. Yeah, okay, great. Tenants in theaters, whatever. This hairstyle, I mean, he looked amazing. Only Tom Cruise can look that good with 97% of his face covered up. Right. You know? Yeah. You, you and I look like bags of shit when we gotta go walk the dog. But this guy, I yeah. mean, he's unstoppable. Yeah. So uh, Very excited. Yeah. And especially if you want to hear... You know, it's possible by now that the, the MI7 has started shooting. And uh, for our Patreon, we do episodes weekly that are very much up to date about the latest news. So, you know, if the shooting started, you can bet that we are doing Patreon episodes about it. So, yeah, you should follow us there on patreon.com slash light the fuse and uh, subscribe at the bonus content level. It's uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, I agree with Charles on that point. And uh, <laughs> before we get started, I, I just got to let let you know who this episode is brought to you by so this episode is brought to you by jeremy dylan so you should check out his podcast my favorite album jeremy is a concert promoter in australia and each week he interviews a different musician songwriter actor or filmmaker about the music they love and how it's influenced them and their work and he's had people like uh rogue nation co-writer drew pierce rose mcgowan bob odenkirk uh casey musgraves and spoiler alert we just recorded another episode with Jeremy, and uh, this time we are talking about Mission Impossible versus 007, which is, I know, a topic that a lot of people love, and we'll have those episodes on our main feed as well, but um, I think people are going to be really interested in that. It's like a 19-part episode, so be ready for that. Um, (laughs) I I don't know. Maybe we'll we'll surprise people and just do it it just one full blowout episode, or maybe it'll be a two-part. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, maybe. Testing people's patience. 
around the world. <laughs> um, this episode is also brought to you by John B. And also Real Estate Interest LLC, commercial real estate for growing companies. And I just want to remind everybody that anybody can contact them and consult with them, even if they're not looking to buy or sell, that they help companies save and strategize too. So if you're in the mood for any of that stuff, contact Real Estate Interest LLC and they will help you out. So I think we should get into it because this episode is great. I don't want to toot our own horn, but this episode's great. So I, I want to get into I want to toot Dan Mendel's horn. Yeah, I want to toot his horn. His horn yeah. is the one that that really needs to be tooted here. Yes. It has nothing to once again, nothing to do with us, everything to do with the guest. Yes. So we will <laughs> uh, throw it over to Kevin's legally punishable music and we'll be we'll be back afterwards. Today we are joined by Dan Mandel, the amazing cinematographer. I hope you're okay with this kind of praise, Dan, first of all, because we're going to be just ladling it on the whole time. I'll, I'll give you an hour to stop it. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, Dan Mandel is, a, is one of the most uh, incredible cinematographers working today, but we are talking to him today primarily about his work on Mission Impossible 3. We always like to ask people, like, did you watch the old show uh, as a kid or anything? Or what was your relationship with Mission Impossible before you signed on to the movie? Um, it was really one of my favorite TV shows as a kid. Yes, I used to watch it religiously. Really? Do you have, yeah. any, do you have any favorite episodes? No. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably older than you, and that makes it uh, really impossible to recall. Uh, you know, it's just... <laughs> it's just the um, the title sequence is something that uh, you know always stayed. But once we once we uh, we realized, or once I realized, I was going to make it. Um, it it it, uh, it was a life changing thing for me, really. Really? How how so? Well, I met JJ. Right. Uh, and um, he's probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever meet, met. Um, he's, he's insanely smart. We would love to meet him and have him on the show at one day. We, we have emailed him, but he, he has not emailed us back. Maybe by the time this comes out, he will have emailed us and said, I can't wait to be on your show. I heard so many great things from Dan Mandel, but we, we're not there yet. <laughs> um, well, he's, he's, he's very generous with his time. I don't see why he would not do it for you. How did you guys come come upon the look of the movie? Because it, it really does look very different from any of the movies that came before it and any of the ones that came after it. So how did you guys kind of settle on that specific look for the third movie? Um, when I met him, he told me uh, I was working with Tony Scott and um, we were doing, I think we had just finished Revenge, or, uh, not Revenge, sorry, uh, Domino, and um, JJ said to me that uh, he really loved the way that Enemy of the State looked and wanted to have that sort of feel for Mission Impossible. And um, I said to him, well, you know, half of the, the, the look comes from the anamorphic format that we shot it in, and the rest was decided in the the art department and uh, in Tony's very specific process of working. And so JJ was immediately sort of all ears and made it his business to understand the look and the feel that anamorphics brought to storytelling because coming from TV, not many people used that format at the time. And so... Basically, we had a, a crash course in that technology and uh, we decided that that was, you know, how it was going to how it was going to go. And um, that's how it ended up, basically. How did you guys decide on the, the close ups and the number of close ups and the frequency with which you would sort of try that stuff out? Because that's sort of like the defining look 
of that movie for a lot of people is just how many close-ups there are uh, and how, how much of Tom Cruise's face you really get to see. <laughs> um, well, it's what happens or it's what used to happen when episodic directors moved into movie making. The, the, the need for close-ups for a TV show is a, a different sort of specific to to what happens in cinema. And um, because obviously the TV's smaller, it sits in the corner, or used to be, and people would watch from, you know, the sofa. And so the need for a close close-up was more uh, intense than for cinema, where obviously you've got a huge screen and you don't want to be too close to somebody because it becomes scary uh, for the audience to get a massive close-up of somebody uh, in in your face. So uh, it was sort of a symbiotic or, a, or, or it happened by osmosis. Uh, JJ always wanted you to go closer and uh, that's what we did. Um, I don't think it really hurt us at all. I don't think it's a bad thing. It's a it's a great punctuation and and it's sort of become one of JJ's looks is that just when you think you're you're as close as you're going to get the camera moves in another few inches and you go, oh yeah that that now we're there right um, um, Charles do you want to ask about some of the set pieces well I also want to, well before that I also wanted to ask about just the the color, the use of color the colors are so gorgeous in this movie. Um, and there were different colors for different parts of the, for like in Shanghai, it seems like there's a diff- slightly different color palette. Like, was it, can you talk about the use of color yeah. in the movie? Yeah, I mean, I do love using color. And um, coming from the Tony Scott school of, of filmmaking, we used to mess around with color an awful lot in the photographic process and the the lighting style and all sorts of things and to me the texturization of a film has a lot to do with color um and the mood that you can set with it is uh for me very very important and so we we took a conscious decision to give the different parts of the movie a different look and feel and um uh, to me, the fact that you're asking the question means that it it it, it works. That yeah. sort of thing does work, and and um, part of the the rationale is also to when you cut cutting back between studio and location and sort of built and not built sets. Um, for me, uh, it's a, I, I hate to be bumped when I'm watching it myself in the cinema and part of the way I try to alleviate that for people watching the movies that I make is to try and make the texture and the 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 lighting as real and as sort of um atmospheric as possible I think you can feel that I mean there's a real texture to everything in this movie that's just amazing yeah definitely it's an important part of the process for me is that uh, the move when you go to a movie it's n- you're not watching a national geographic documentary you're watching a story and you want the story to be as uh, enveloping if that is a word as possible you you want to sit there and just be and inhale everything and to me color is part of that Amazing. What is the process with JJ for you? I mean, you've done a lot of movies with him up until even just now, the latest Rise of Skywalker. Do you shot list with him? Do you do storyboards or is it storyboards for some sequences, shot lists for other? I mean, what is that kind of, um, how do you come up with your plan with JJ for how to shoot each scene? We don't really have a set plan uh, of how these things work. But what happens is early on in the movie, we interact with the art department as we go through the sets and the locations. And that gives us a huge amount of information or gives me a huge amount of information about what 
he's thinking in terms of mood and in um you know what is what is involved in shooting those particular se- scenes and sequences and we go from there to the built sets and the sort of manifestations uh off paper and into the real world and during that process what i like to do is um shoot copious amounts of tests on the sets and uh on a, uh, a we'll set up a special stage to shoot tests on where we look at textures and colors and wardrobe and props and paints and everything so that we really have a a, a great idea of how things are going to look when we shoot them but when it comes to the actual day of shooting unless it's a really major stunt sequence or something that involves a really technical amount you know amount of technical equipment we will basically arrive on set and he will map it out on the spot and we we will literally uh seat of the pants style go through it rehearse block it light it shoot it he he likes he likes to be very spontaneous about it that's it that's that's very surprising isn't that surprising to you charles cuz cuz yes. uh Marianne and mary jo talked to us about this kind of like multiple shot thing that jj does a lot and he he does it a lot it's some in mission impossible 3 a lot in star trek and and the star wars where you know it'll be a long shot that kind of does several different things sort of in the way that spielberg does it so even shots like that that have these different components are just sort of improvised essentially yeah i mean i i would be um i would be reticent to use improvised okay because what happens is what happens is that we will rehearse with the actors on the set and we will all watch what's going on and one of the real benefits of working with a director that's also a writer is that he's listening to the words as well as working out the geography so often the script will change when he hears the words acted out for him on the set he'll go oh no i don't like that or can can we do it like this or something like that so it's a multi leveled sort of approach where it's not just us dialing in the camera move and the lighting uh it's also the words and that will guide him and us uh in how we're going to cover the scene and so as you said he will with myself and the camera operators start to choreograph a master shot that covers all the details by moving the camera from place to place around the set following the actors going from a wide master into a a close up and often that'll be it that'll be the coverage mm. and it takes a very brave man to do that um because obviously when you get to cutting you don't have much coverage up your sleeve so if you screw it up you've got what you've got and so we're quite fastidious about it and um so basically Marianne and uh, and the editors are right he does do that uh but um we've sort of in in the last couple of movies in the the last two star wars we got a bit more precise about it because he often decided that it would be better to shoot it with one camera uh and not try to accomplish too much with two cameras or more uh in terms of telling the story and so um you know it's something that has fermented and grown over the last decade or so um but i i do think that he is still one of the most well he is one of the most engaging filmmakers out there for the viewer even if you don't realize it that's yeah. as a as a viewer so so are you you're mainly shooting with one camera nowadays with him cuz that's pretty different that tony scott would shoot with multiple cameras right yeah absolutely no 
He's he's more uh, judicious with uh, how we how we go about it because he wants the photography and the close ups and the sort of establishes to have a bit more uh, quality to them. And the way you do that is by shooting with one camera. Right. Yeah. But that's not to say we didn't use many cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, that's my favorite kind of filmmaking. We yeah, like we always talk about John McTiernan on the show. He's one of my favorite directors, uh, who did uh, Die Hard, and, and yeah. you know, he always talks about that. That you know, yeah, yeah. shooting with one camera is that's the you know, it's always it's always in the work that I've done to the DPs. I always work with. They always want to do. You don't want to cross shoot with cameras because then you're you're sacrificing lighting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Drew, did you want to ask about set pieces? Yeah, well, I mean, what what was your sort of approach to these set pieces? Because each one looks different. Like, obviously, the Berlin sequence looks so different from the Vatican, looks so different from the from the bridge. Did you have kind of a, an overarching idea about how you were going to tackle these, or or what were, what was JJ's sort of design of these these uh, set pieces, and and how did you kind of accomplish them? I think that the thing that dictates most everything is whether there are visual effects or not involved in in the sequence. And um, I think that the the bridge sequence and the helicopter sequence where um, they're flying through the windmills uh, and what's going on in... Um, Shanghai, they all had a massive amount of visual effects involved mm. in them. And when, when that happens, that really does take away from the ability to use spontaneous photography because everything's measured out and everything's pre-calculated. So um, what we tried to do was not let the visual effects dictate how the sequence were going to were going to be made in the sense that there's a level of clunkiness that arrives when you do that and McTiernan and those guys back in the day everything was in camera mm -hmm. and that's why we love that so much it just just looks and feels the way it is so the bridge, for example, was a, we built that in a field in Calabasas. And it was, I, I was really skeptical about that. But at some point or another, as a cinematographer, you've got to really trust the visual effects guys around you when you're doing stuff like that. And I learned a massive life lesson on that movie working with Roger. Yeah. And, um, it, that's what started my relationship with with him, and with his help, we were able to make those sequences work. They were very precisely pre-vised. They were very precisely mapped out and built, and they were very precisely shot. Well, we we're always fascinated with like, what is your relationship with Roger? I mean, you've done so many movies with him, or or somebody from ILM, you know, the last few movies, and. You know, I, I just watched the Skywalker documentary. I don't think Charles has watched it yet. But, I mean, you guys are back-to-back -back in Jordan on all these crazy, you know, locations and sets. And so, like, what is that relationship like? Well, it's one of the most exciting parts of my job is working with visual effects, not only from a technocratic point of view, but also from the aesthetic point of view. And Roger like a lot of his colleagues and people in his part of the industry, is not only a technocrat, but he's an artist. And he has a massive appreciation for the art of cinema. And the art of cinema, as far as I'm concerned, has enveloped CG effects. And they've got better and better and better over the last decade and a half, say, and one of the reasons why it's got better is because of people like Roger, uh, who has um, an aesthetic that allows guys like me to bring our ideas and, and foibles into their arena 
account for them and make us look like geniuses. <laughs> uh, and how can you not love that? Yeah. So you're, are, do you like pass off information to them? Like, this is the light streak that we got from inside the Enterprise that you can do outside of it. Or I mean, like, are you kind of like, are you guys trading information like that all the time? Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, the, they have left us in the dust. Uh, <laughs> in, the begin, in the beginning, they took a lot of information from us. They were interested in what we were doing and how we were doing it, but they've actually banked all that. They've got it in the databases and they don't actually need us anymore. They could do it all by themselves if they wanted to. <laughs> um, but on a daily basis, if I'm shooting those kind of things and those guys are with me, I listen to every single word they say because I try to give them the tools that they need to make me look good. And if that means sharing information, I share absolutely everything that I have. Wow. I will... it, it, we're, making, we're making the movie, you know? It's yeah. for everybody. It's not, it's, there's no I in team. Right. Are there, uh, are there cinematographers that you admired when you started in this? I mean, obviously you were, did you start as a first, uh, as a first AC, like a camera assistant for, uh, for Tony Scott's movies? Uh, I started making the tea in a studio when I was a kid. And, wow. Uh, I, the first real cinematographer I was introduced to was a guy called Michael Saracen. And Michael had shot just so many movies that uh, I went back and looked at. And I got to work with guys like Peter Bijou and... Then I started working as a, a, a camera assistant, a, a loader, and worked on a, a Tony Scott movie as a trainee loader. And from that moment, Tony t sort of took a liking to me and basically set my career on its, on its way. He gave me everything that I have and taught me everything that I know. Uh, or knew up to a point. And um, uh, it was just one of those priceless things that happens to people in their lives. Wow, he's he he was one of our favorites. I mean, still is one of our favorites. And yeah, it kills I mean, me that we, we don't have more, we don't have, you know, new Tony Scott movies coming out. It's just yeah. devastating. It is. I, I mean, you know, as a, uh, a youngster, I grew up watching... Nixon and um, all Bob's films. I love him. I think he's he's one of the greatest cinematographers ever. I think he's probably more responsible for the look and feel of modern filmmaking than people realize. That so many people emulate his style. I think that um, I have more heroes than not in in the cinematographic world. And um, it, it it's a it's an ever changing art form, which uh, is what makes it so exciting for me. I think. Yeah. Do you have any uh, specific Tony Scott stories from um, Enemy of the State or or Spy <laughs> Game or or Domino or, or other ones that you or, worked on or, as well? Or, or Crimson Tide or yeah. Um, uh, there are so many stories. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that um, what he sort of encapsulated uh, as an action film director was the, well, there are two things. One, he, as a, um, an immigrant in America, uh, his view of Americana was so sort of stylized that he, as well as his brother and other commercial makers at the time, reshaped the way that uh, perhaps America was viewed overseas. And so in movies like Top Gun and um, what was that uh, indie movie, the, the, the race car movie? Um, Days of Thunder. Yeah. Days of Thun Thunder. He kind of brought an Americana view of America 
back to life again. And, and Michael Bay sort of picked it up from Tony and ran with it. And for me, working uh, with Tony at that time exposed me to the idea that um, storytelling, the glossiness that he brought to it uh, was something that was missing to that point. And the, the, the idea that the sort of front cover of Vogue could be put into, uh, aesthetically, could be put into movies and people would just love it. And, and that's what he did. And that's what Bob did too. This kind of stylized, hyper real look that uh, people still emulate today. Um, for me is something that uh, I took away from Tony. Uh, but he, as a, as a, a director, had the, the, the ability to confuse guys like me and technicians on the, on the set in order to buy himself time. <laughs> and while, while he was confusing us and we would be running around thinking, oh my God, oh my God, he would be sitting rereading the script or the sequence and trying to figure his way out of a, perhaps a dead end that he had got himself into <laughs> without letting any, anybody realise what was going on. And uh, that was a very, very useful tool that I picked up from him. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you know, sometimes I... I think it was on Spy Game. We we had a massive night exterior uh, in in uh, Washington D.C. and so Tony was in his trailer. It was late afternoon, and we were turning all the lights on, getting ready for the exterior. And um, he he sent for me to come to his trailer, I went in this trailer and he said, uh, let's, let's walk the, the set. So we, we went out and he walked out the door of the trailer and he said, um, why are the lights facing that direction? We're shooting in the other direction. And I said, no, we're not. We talked about shooting this way. And he said, no, 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 that, that's not true. You've made a mistake. And I, I thought, oh, Jesus, how, how did I make that mistake? And he said, call me when you're ready. <laughs> and he went back in the, tra in the trailer. Basically, he, he framed me. <laughs> and um, I took it as that I had made the mistake. I, c I couldn't believe that, a, that, that he was actually just trying to buy himself time. Wow. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, I became very acutely aware of uh, working with him after that, that he was really great at doing that kind of thing, he, just fooling people into thinking that they had sort of heard him incorrectly or whatever, and he'd go, OK, just call me when you're ready. <laughs> wow, it's a great problem-solving device. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've got to well, ask yeah, you. I mean, I learned, I was going to say, I learned from that, that when you're on set and there's huge things going on and, and the director says, wants to change his mind or wants to do something that you didn't discuss or anything like that, that it's our job to say, yeah, no problem. Uh, just give me half an hour and I'll fix it. I'll get it, you know, I'll do whatever I can. It's not to get upset and pissy and stamp your foot and go, no, no, that's not what we discussed. Uh, we've got to do it like this. And I think that that's the, one of the biggest takeaways I took away from working with Tony over the years was the idea that you should be able to adjust and, and do it gracefully without... Um, you know, getting pissy about anything. Right.
right, that was it. Dan Mandel, part one in the books. All right. How you feeling yeah. about that, Charles? Pretty great. It was it was awesome to hear him talk about J.J. Abrams and how his process has evolved over the years and how J.J. Uh, wanted the look of Enemy of the State for MI3. And uh, there was just a lot of interesting stuff in there. I mean, it was, it was cool to hear about Tony Scott, the story about Tony Scott, and <laughs> pretty crazy how he would... Uh, how he would buy himself some time. Uh, <laughs> that was pretty crazy to hear about that. You ever do stuff like that, Charles? N- no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have the uh, the pull to do something like that or, or the budgets to, have to be able to pull off something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, that was great. He's so awesome. And uh, we'll have more next week, obviously. But until then, as Charles said at the beginning of the episode, if you want to jump on that Patreon... Do it now, because we are going to have more and more fire content over there. You know, we've got commentaries, we've got interviews, we've got bonus episodes, all this stuff uh, that you could never get anywhere else, really. And, uh, you know, if you can't do that, if you want to buy a T-shirt from TeePublic, that would help. And also, if you could just rate and review. Have you seen how many reviews Carly has, Charles? No, I don't want to know. Is it a lot? I think over a thousand at this point. What? So, she just started yeah. her podcast like two weeks ago. I know. I know. We're getting <laughs> run circles around. Wow. By her. So, yes, please help us out. Write a review. Give us a rating. You know, if you feel so inclined, give us five stars. Yeah, that would be a huge help. And just tell people about the podcast. Anything helps, really, at this point. So, uh, that would be huge for us. Um, anything else we got to go over, Charles, before we go? No, that's about all I've got. Just come back next week for more Dan Mindell. I mean, we talk about Star Trek, uh, John Carter, Shanghai Noon, The Born Identity, more Star Wars stuff. There, there are a lot of great stories. So you should definitely come back. Great. See you then. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.